Okay. 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 So I'm going to spend the whole hour basically talking about uh, the astronomer's proposal tool. If you proposed for HST, uh, you know about APT, and if not, it's the same uh, package as used for HST proposals. Um, so it's basically your proposal for de designing uh, your JWST observations, uh, and that involves a few different steps. Um, the first of which is defining moving targets. It's also similar to the way you define other targets that are fixed. Uh, and moving targets come in three different types in APT. It's somewhat arbitrary uh, separation, but this is the way the system works. So there are standard moving targets, and these are things like the major planets, the dwarf planets, uh, satellites of the major planets, uh, longitudes on the planets, uh, various things like that. So you start all that by selecting a standard target type of uh, planet, and then there's sort of a workflow that I'll demonstrate to get to these other types of things, satellites around planets and longitudes on planets. Uh, the second type is uh, asteroids, and so that's anything like a near-Earth object, Trojan objects, uh, main belt asteroids, TNOs, anything that's in a solar orbit that doesn't have a coma. And then comets, uh, the unique aspect of the comets is that the interface allows you to uh, have non-gravitational terms due to the outgassing. And so if you need particular comet uh, orbital elements, you select comet rather than an asteroid. If it's a non non-gassy comet, you can also go to get to it through the asteroid interface. Um, once you've got a target defined, the next step is to define observations of your target. Uh, so that involves uh, pick one of the targets that you've defined. You're, you can define the observation without picking the target, but the workflow would be to first pick the target, then you would pick an instrument. Uh, we have four instruments, near cam, near spec, near and nearest. Then for that instrument, there will be a, a series of science templates, uh, for instance, imaging or uh, IFU spectroscopy uh, templates. Uh, some of those may require that you set up target acquisition or allow you to set up target acquisition if you're really sensitive to pointing. And then you define an exposure specification. So this is picking your filters and or dispersers. Uh, your detector readout parameters and things like that, dithers. Um, and just to note, the, the, once, you've, once you've created a moving target, uh, you can observe that target using any of the instruments and any of the observing templates. Uh, <clears throat> you can also use APT to define scheduling constraints on your observations, so simple timing constraints. Um, you can also, for satellites, uh, say I want to observe the satellite when it's more than 10 arc seconds from the primary or from another satellite. Uh, you can constrain the rate of motion at the time of the observation, rotational phases, uh, solar phase angle, distance from the sun, all sorts of uh, stuff that's all HST heritage. So there are a lot of uh, constraints that you can apply to your observation if that supports your science case. Got it separation from another body, so do you have to specify what that other body is, or does the system just make sure it's... Well, so it's for the standard targets, so if you pick Ganymede, the, that's, a, that's sort of a composite. It's Jupiter, Ganymede, and so you can then say, observe it when it's this far from this other, from Jupiter. From Jupiter. Yeah, I haven't played with it a whole bunch, so, but I believe you can also, you can also put in eclipses between satellites. There's a, a whole zoo of, of things that are in there that were defined for HST, and we're just getting them for free. Uh, John, these constraints are for the phase two proposals in APT, right? So there's, uh, so yeah, I was just about to get that. So um, submission for JWST is, is going to be single phase. There are, there are no phase two proposals. There's just a proposal, <laughs> and it includes everything that's your science justification, as well as all the completely defined observations. So that's that's one of the reasons that we went with the instrument templates. So in general, it should be 
hopefully a little easier to find the observations up front. So reduce the workload and complexity at that stage so that you can submit one time. Um, and that's to, because it's a limited live commission, we, this decision was made to try and make sure that we got science turnover and data turnover more quickly. And so one, re, one way to compress that was to just go with a single phase. Um, so, uh, yeah, so then there's sort of a, a standard interface for defining science investigators, attaching a science justification, um, and things like that. I'm just a, the separation from another body, just one more time. It doesn't check for background stars, does it? No. Is that ever a problem? Background stars? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So that's something the observer would have to be. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and get to that. We'll see. Okay. Depends on how many questions I get. Um, so APT does not provide sensitivity information. So to do that, you need to learn how to use the ETC. So see the webinar next week. Uh, APT is not fully documented yet. Uh, we're working on the user documentation. And the URL for that is given in blue here. Uh, and that's growing steadily. Uh, we don't yet have a moving targets or solar system page for that, but we're working on that. Um, and give yourself some time because it is it is a little bit complex, and so you'll need to try things a few times. Uh, so things that are not there are ephemeris <laughs> visualization against all sky images and catalogs, and so this was something that Herschel and Spitzer proposers would be familiar with, um, but it's not, not there for the JWST version of APT yet, so you can't look for background stars. You can't look for background stars because oh. it won't overlay an ephemeris for you. Um, and in general, for any kind of visualization of the instrument field of view against all sky images, you have to use a fixed target at this time. So you can't do that visualization except if you just pretend, make up a fixed target that represents your, your moving target at a specific epoch. Um, and there are some aspects of target acquisition, especially for near spec, that are being developed yet. OK, so I'm going to go through a few slides just about what JWST is like and some constraints on what you can and can't do. And then I'll come back to the APT section. So if people are downloading and installing APT, you, can, you still have a little bit of time before I really jump into that. So. Uh, JWST's field of regard is limited to elongate, solar elongation angles of 85 to 135 degrees. This is familiar to people that observe the Spitzer and Herschel. And the reason for that is to keep the um, cold part of the observatory, the telescope and the instruments, in uh, behind the sunshade uh, so that they can stay cold. And also uh, deals with the bulk of the scattered light that you would have if, if you didn't do that. Um, so the observatory can uh, spin around the sun observatory line 360 degrees, and so you get an annulus on the sky. And as the observatory goes around the sun, you're able to view any point on the sky twice a year. Uh, in the ecliptic, you've got about a 45-day uh, window uh, for any target in the ecliptic. At the ecliptic poles, you've got small cones that define the continuous viewing zone. Um, not going to be useful for solar system observations, but that's where the continuous viewing zone is. So that's all sort of uh, laid out schematically in this this slide. So just remember that you're going to be observing near quadrature, not at opposition. Um, this just shows how the instrument fields of view are uh, scattered around in the JWST focal plane. So I mentioned the four instruments. MIRI is the thermal imager and spectrometer. NEARIS is a, a near-infrared imager. NEARCAM is the primary near-infrared imager. FGS is the guider. It's not a science instrument, but you can see where its fields of view are. And then NEARSPEC is the near-infrared spectrometer. And depending on whether you're looking in the direction you're, the observatory is going or looking in the direction the observatory just came from, these fields of view flip around on the sky in ecliptic coordinates. And so that's all shown here schematically. Uh, we have a
track rate limit with JWST of 30 milli arc seconds per second. Um, so we did some statistical studies to find out how limiting that was. The worst case is for near-Earth asteroids, as shown in the upper right. And what we found was that for any, any given NEO on any given day, you have a 91% probability of being able to observe it. So that's, even though we do have this speed limit, even for the fastest moving objects, you have a very high probability that you could observe them any day. And you would be able to observe all of them on some day. So you might not be able to observe it when it's closest to the observatory and moving the fastest, but you will be able to observe it. Um, so there's some recommended reading if you want to learn about the science that can be done with JWST. So there are a system of 12 papers, or a system, a set of 12 papers published in PASP early in 2016. Um, they were volume 128, issues 959 and 960. So there are a whole bunch of topical papers. And then there's one paper over an overview of the solar system capabilities, the sort of the things I'm talking about right at the moment. Uh, lead author was Stephanie Milam. And then in volume 960, there was a single paper that gives a nice uh, overview of all sorts of solar system science in one paper. Uh, and that happened to come out slightly after the others. But anyway, those are all great papers if you want to get an idea of what kinds of science you can address using JWST. Uh, okay, so jumping into, into APT itself, the first thing to do is to uh, start a proposal. And so the way to do that, when you open APT, it'll look quite blank. And so the first thing to do is in the upper left, there's a button for new document, and you want to press that and then uh, select new JWST proposal. Once you do that, you'll see the view that's presented on this slide. Um, and so you have subsections of that blank proposal for proposal information, targets, observations, and then observation links. And so uh, I'll spend just a couple slides on this sort of introductory part of it, the proposal information. You have areas for your title, an abstract, science category, and a PDF attachment for the science justification. Uh, I just wanted to note that all my charts were prepared uh, a little while ago last summer, and so uh, the version number is a little bit of out of date, but that doesn't have very much impact on anything I have to say today. Um, so another thing to note is uh, red X's are going to be all over the place when you start, and so that just means that those are fields that you have to fill in. Um, and if you don't fill them in, you're going to have a hard time submitting your proposal. And if you mouse over the red X, it'll actually tell you a little bit about the problem. And there's also a way to look at a, a problem report that gives you quite a bit of detail. And so uh, in general, it's not it's not that hard to, to resolve those. Um, and if you're having a hard time, you can always send a help desk a question. So there's sort of a hierarchical view on the left, which helps you na navigate between the different pieces of the proposal, between targets and observations, uh, between different observations. Um, so it's a nice way to uh, get around in the proposal quickly. And then the form editor is probably the um, view that you'll show or use most frequently. And so if you notice in the upper left of the APT window, the form editor button is, is selected. It's light blue. And so the view that you see is the form editor. There's also a spreadsheet view that's the button to the right of the form editor button. Um, and that can be useful for quick editing tasks where you want to do something similar to a whole bunch of different observations or targets or uh, labels, that kinds of thing. Uh, and I don't remember why I have this chart in here. Um, We'll skip that. OK, so the first thing about doing solar system observations is to specify a moving target. So if you go to the left navigation panel and select the targets uh, item there, you'll get the interface that's shown in this chart. And the third 
uh, button down is new solar system target. So that's where all the moving targets functionality is. All the others are for fixed targets. If you go into the new solar system target and you'll get a form editor that looks like this one. And so you can enter your target name, uh, a keyword, a description. Some of this is, I, I think is gonna go away or, or become optional. Um, and then uh, going back to what I said earlier about the um, types of targets, the level one type is either standard, comet, or asteroid. And so the next thing you need to do is figure out which type, which of those types of target you're interested in observing. So you you select, uh, click on that level one uh, type button. And in this case, I picked the level one type of asteroid and uh, I decided I wanted to observe Sedna. And uh, so that's all you need to do at that point. But you'll notice in the left navigation panel, there's a target Sedna with a level two uh, piece underneath it. And so the next thing you need to do is go to that sub sub menu for that target. So the asteroid level, uh, level one interface. And so once you're there, uh, there's an interface where you can type in the name of your target in the top, uh, top box. So I entered Sedna and hit the search button and uh, the software contacts the Horizons database at JPL and finds all the targets that match what you typed into the search. In this case, there's only one. And so uh, it tells you all of its different uh, possible IDs. And if you click OK, uh, oh, this is, let me go, uh, yeah, I'll skip I'll skip that other chart. Um, so it fills in the what you searched for, and then it fills in the NAIF name field with the official number and name of that target, if it has either or both of those, and gives you the NAIF ID. And then the next thing, uh, in the old days, you would have to go to Horizons and fill in all the stuff at the bottom of this form by hand, cut and paste. Um, but we've implemented this. Um, You'll notice right under the grayed out NAIF name and NAIF ID fields, there's a button that says Use Horizons for Orbital Elements. So if you click that, uh, it warns you that if you have orbital elements, you're going to replace them by doing this. You say that's fine. Can you put in your own orbital elements at this point? You can. Yeah. So you can do, you, you're not required to click that button. And if you do click it, you can undo it. Um, so if you if you do click it and click and say OK, you get a view like this. And so you'll notice that again, all these fields with the orbital elements are grayed out, which means they can't be edited. Um, but if you wanted to edit them for some reason, you could simply unclick that Use Horizons button above, and they would become edit editable. So that's allowed. You could put in your own, make up your own target. Just right, but we keep track. We're going to keep track of what you did. <laughs> So that does go into the database, whether you're putting in your own or using Horizons. Okay, so th that's that's the procedure you would use for asteroids. It's just very slightly different for comets. Um, so then I wanted to go back and show you how to do uh, standard targets. So this is something like planets, satellites of planets. And so in this case, uh, I've decided I want to observe Callisto. It's a satellite. So, and then in order to get to Callisto, you have to go through a level one type of Jupiter. So what you do is in the level one selector there, you pick uh, st uh, standard and then you do, uh, I believe it's on the next page, yeah, Under, underneath that target, then you get a selector for what, uh, which standard target you want to pick. If you open that up, uh, you'll see all the planets in there, and I selected Jupiter. So then you go back, and 
you've got your standard level one is Jupiter, and then you need to do level two type is going to be a standard target. And once you do that, you get another subcategory on the left for the level two type for this target. If you highlight that, you'll get a selection, a selector, and if you open that up, it has all the satellites of Jupiter in there, and then you pick the one you want. So it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit hierarchical uh, that you have to go through this um, multiple ways, you know, a couple of levels in order to get to the satellites. They're, it's not just Callisto; it's Jupiter and then Callisto. But once you've tried it a couple times, it's probably pretty straightforward. <clears throat> and then if you want to do uh, a certain uh, longitude on. Callisto, you can do that. You pick a level three type here and pick Bonita Graphic. And then uh, you get yet a third level underneath the Callisto target at the left. If you highlight that, uh, it gives you an interface like this. So you can put in a, a longitude, a latitude. I don't know what altitude means. <laughs> uh, it's for planets with atmospheres. <laughs> Jupiter. Yeah, maybe at the limb of Jupiter or something. I'm not quite sure. Okay. Maybe you have experience with HST for that? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so, you, uh, so you can specify down to, you know, particular places on planets and their satellites is, is the main point. Okay, so I wanted to... Uh, that is all this so far. This, is, you, this isn't used for HST at this time. All the stuff you just basically told us? Yeah. Basically, this is all HST... Or same thing. Yeah. So it's, it's been tested in use. And yeah, it was uh, for cycle 24. It was available with the new the new name resolver and stuff like that. Was the new piece. Uh, I have a question about the name resolver. So mm -hmm. in past cycles for HST, <coughs> you could do all this, but then the up the data that you eventually get and the data that are in the archive don't preserve the target definition or the names ID and that kind of stuff. Right. Is that now preserved in for instance a file header or something? Yeah, so we've we uh, I can't say it's implemented today, uh -huh. but the intention is that we will capture all that information okay. and that It'll be very hard for you to to screw up the name of the target so people can't okay. find it later in the archive. <laughs> That'll be really good for the archive. Yeah, it's been a horrible thing with the HST archive, and so yeah, we're, we'll be sort of uh, enforcing regularized names for JWST targets. Well, actually, for the username, it just wouldn't matter as much if, if you preserve all that. You can type on the on the upper level for the target itself. You can type. You can call it whatever you want, but the database is still going to tell tell people it's set. <laughs> Uh, if if JP if, if between the time you write the proposal and the time it executes JPL updates the ephemeris, is there any procedure for catching that? So uh, this is a, a philosophical battle I'm having with PPS. Um, every observ other observatory that's done this kind of thing has simply used the latest orbital elements from JPL at the time of the observation, and at this point. We're still planning for JWST that you would get an email saying, we're about to schedule your observation. Would you please update the orbital elements? So you would have to open the proposal, pull it up, you know, yeah. download it, open it, update the orbital elements, and then resubmit it. We'll, um, I'll but, keep fighting that fight. But the schedule could call for an execution six months from now, right? Well, the scheduling, I think this is would be the short term. The long range schedule, I think, is one month. So you'd probably get a one month warning okay. that, yeah, we're going to schedule you sometime in the next four weeks. So, so, but, it is, so it is pretty near term. Yeah, fairly near. Yeah, I think once you get that email, it's pretty certain you're going to end up on the schedule. Okay, so I'm going to go through, I think I've got time to do one instrument template and then we'll open up some questions. Uh, there's a little bit of preamble stuff here about templates in general. Um, so just a reminder, these are the uh, these are the four instruments. So near cam is in the left upper box. Uh, near is in the lower left box. Near spec is in the upper right box, and Miri is in the lower right box. And so this 
basically is one chart telling you what each of these instruments can do and what the templates that you'll be looking at are. And when you select that instrument in APT and then look at templates. So for NearCam, for instance, uh, if you select that, you're going to be able to do 0.6 to 5 micron imaging or slitless spectroscopy, and you get short wave and long wave data simultaneously. Um, so that's, you get one filter in the 0.6 to 2.3 micron band, one filter in the 2.4 to 5 micron band, their fields of view overlap on the sky, and you get the data simultaneously. Um, and so there's, there's an imaging template, there's a coronography template, there's a time series template that could be useful for uh, stellar occultations. There's a GRISM time series template that might also be useful for stellar occultations. And then there's a <clears throat> wide field GRISM imaging that probably won't be useful for uh, solar system observations at all. Uh, so I don't want to go through all those just in the interest of time, but uh, this gives you an idea of what the instrument capabilities are, and there's a lot more information available on the documentation page, and there are instrument flyers also available at the JWST website. Are there science use cases for choreography? For moving targets? Yes. No, I'm not. Uh, I, we don't have a white paper about choreography on moving targets, <laughs> but I wouldn't be surprised. I, mean, I, see, I see it here in your can, but not in the new one. Yeah, I think I think I just kind of ran out of space in the box. <laughs> Mary does have a coronagraphic mode that's really good. Um, okay, so so uh, the templates are a way to in, to organize the capabilities and the inputs that you need to make uh, in a convenient format. Um, it's focused, as I mentioned, on one application. For instance, imaging or spectroscopy. Uh, an observation is defined as an instance of a template that you've filled out. So once you do that, uh, you have an ob you've defined an observation. It includes the target and all the instrument parameters. Uh, you can fill out different templates for different instruments, uh, and those can all be in combined into a single proposal. Uh, all the instruments for JWST are always available, so it's not like uh, Spitzer, where one instrument was on at a time when they had campaigns. You can do near spec spectroscopy and then switch to MIRI immediately afterwards and take data with MIRI. So everything's available constantly. Um, <clears throat> and then you can uh, group and sequence your observations if that is useful for you. Uh, once you've kind of gotten the hang of it, a lot of the template interfaces have a lot of very similar features. And so will start to feel fairly familiar fairly quickly, I think. And the templates, the other thing they do is they give you a sort of a logical workflow design. If you start at the top of the template and just sort of work your way down, that's basically the, about the best way to define an observation. You're not required to do that. You may decide later that you want to you know, just work on exposures. You don't have to do any of the stuff before that in order to do that. But it is a fairly logical workflow. Um, is given there graphically. <clears throat> so the templates will, will try and prevent you from making very bad choices for uh, for your observations and exposures. Uh, they do limit your flexibility a little bit in, in some ways, but there's still a lot of flexibility in there. Um, and as mentioned earlier, this is how we're how we're able to switch from a two stream to a, a or two phase to a single phase of a proposal process, and simplify operations and proposal processing overall. Uh, one of the things that you'll run up against in the in the templates are the exposure definitions for for JWST and. These are discussed in terms of, of somewhat abstract terms. And so there are exposure uh, patterns. Uh, and those exposure patterns are com composed of groups and frames and uh, co uh, 
grouped frames, skipped frames, and the number of groups. And so this is a notional example. Uh, the vertical tick marks are just uh, time tick marks. And so before you start taking an exposure, the detectors will be in an idle reset mode. And so every, uh, for instance, 10 seconds, uh, the, the detector will just be resetting, 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 and resetting until it gets an exposure command. And then in this particular example, uh, the pattern that you was picked consists of four frames that are marked in dark blue that would be co-added on board, and then four frames that are skipped. Those are marked in light blue, which would just be ignored. And then depending on how many groups you asked for in your exposure, you would get multiple sections of four co-added plus four skipped frames, and those would be uh, collected as signal uh, integrated up in the pixels on the detector. And so the red line is representing the, the counts or electrons accumulating in the pixel. The dark and light blue uh, tick marks are showing when that pixel would be sampled. And then at the end of the exposure, in the final group, you don't, you don't bother to do those skipped frames. You just ignore those, and so you, after, as soon as you're done collecting the four, uh, four reads that would be co-added on board, the detector resets. And then if you ask for multiple integrations, this, in this example there are two integrations, that pattern would be re repeated. And so in this case you would get two uh, sample, up, sample up the ramp integrations uh, with no pointing change between them or anything. This just happens contiguously for as many integrations as you ask. And then at the end of that, the detector would go back into idle mode. Um, and the signal from your source is proportional to the slope of the red line. So the, and th this uh, approach to collecting data was implemented due to, primarily due to data volume constraints on the observatory. So we, we simply can't detect or we can't collect data at full rate from all the all the detectors all the time. And so uh, these exposure patterns were defined so that we could reduce that data volume to something that could be managed. What is T duration on this chart? Is there some uh, group that's larger than an integration? Yeah, so in this case, it's the, it's the sum of the two integrations. So your total exposure time for this exposure would be two times the integration time. And it, so an integration is one ramp. An exposure can be one or more ramps. So this is showing the, the near cam exposure patterns. Near cam has the most complicated uh, set of exposure patterns, but basically uh, the, the pattern names are meant to indicate sort of the app application. Rapid mode would be for your brightest sources. Bright modes would be for uh, somewhat less bright sources. And then going on down to the deep modes, which you would probably use for extragalactic astronomy, where you want to have you know, 2,000 second integrations and the like. Um, and the, the in frames is the number of frames that get co-added on board, and skip is the number of frames that get dropped uh, in each of those patterns. So all you'll see in APT, though, is the pattern. You're not going to, it's not going to tell you what in groups is, it's or it's not going to tell you what in frames is, it's not going to tell you what in skips is, you just have to know that from the documentation. You'll just see the pattern name. Um, this is a summary spreadsheet that I don't want to um, go into in detail, but <clears throat> it gives you some examples. So for an instrument and a pattern name on the left, and then for a, just uh, in groups of five as a standard exposure for each of those. And for, in a couple of cases, uh, full frame imaging or subarray imaging, it gives you over on the right what the integration time, so the time per integration ramp uh, uh, is given on the right. So you can see for near cam, for instance, if you have rapid in groups of five and full frame imaging, you get an integration time of 54 seconds, 53.7. If you pick near cam and deep two,
full frame imaging, you get an integration time of 880 seconds. So the, the pattern name is going to have an important influence over on the length of that integration time. So this is... What is times change? Yeah, so I... Uh, yeah. <laughs> There, it's a multi multi-dimensional parameter space. So I did I put in a couple of subarray examples, uh, for instance, a 320 and a 64 subarray for near cam, and a 128 subarray for Miri, just to show you how the subarrays come into play a little bit. But you can also pick subarrays. <clears throat> it takes less time to read out a subarray, and so that also affects your integration time. <clears throat> so this is for. Uh, Handy reference when you're first trying to build your APP proposals, you can't figure out what's going on with your exposure times. Okay, so let's do a near cam template. Um, this is, uh, so in the left part of the APT interface here, you notice uh, there's, I'm in the observation section now instead of the targets, and I've added a, an observation. Uh, and I'm calling it Callisto Imaging, uh, and I picked the instrument as near cam, and I picked the template as near cam imaging. That's a pull down that has all the other templates underneath it, and I picked the target of Callisto. Uh, ignore the visit this visit splitting stuff for now, um, and then you, across the bottom there are a few tabs. So there's the, the main tab, which is the same as the template name, your cam imaging. And then you can set up mosaics, you can uh, place requirements. There's special requirements that apply only for solar system targets, some of the stuff I was talking about earlier. And you can add comments to that observation. Um, but the meat of the matter is the um, first tab. And so there you're going to select a module. Near cam comes in two halves that are identical. and you are going to pick either one of those, you pick one of them or both of them. And then you can also pick subarrays and uh, dither patterns. So let's go into that. Um, so in this case, I picked module B. If you want to do subarray imaging for bright sources, you have to pick module B. The subarrays are not available in module A. And there are reasons for that that I won't get into, but uh, there's no reason to support it on both modules, and so we uh, arbitrarily selected module B for subarray imaging. Um, so you pick the module, and then in the subarray pull down, you can pick full frame or a selected set of subarray sizes. Uh, the next, uh, so the subarray affects both the, ex the exposure time, so you can take shorter exposures in, su in subarray mode than in full frame mode, but it also uh, gives you a smaller field of view on sky. So those are the two things to keep in mind about subarrays. And the next thing to pick is uh, a dither pattern. Um, and for near cam, the dithers are broken into two types. There's the primary, which are essentially large dithers that are meant to um, fill in gaps in the field of view. So we have, uh, in a single module, there are five detectors, one long wave and four short wave and the sh four short waves have gaps between them. Uh, the two modules also have a gap, so these primary dithers are mostly there to fill in the gaps in the short wave field of view or, and or fill in the gap between the two modules if you're <coughs> imaging using both modules. <coughs> so you don't, you're, you're allowed to pick a primary dither type of none, which just means it won't do any of those dithers. And then, uh, there are also subpixel dither, dithers, and these are not dithers within a single pixel, but they're um, dithers that are an integer, a small integer plus a fraction of a, a pixel offset. And so those are there to give you improved PSF sampling and uh, bad pixel replacement, things like that. So dithering is recommended, especially subpixel dithering if you're doing uh, point sources. If you're doing very extended objects, you might need to do some of the primary dithers as well. Okay, so at that point, uh, you're done down down to the point where you're going to start saying what filters you want to observe in and what exposure you want to take. So let's do that. So if you um, 
what you have to do is click the add button so you you can see there's that pink line there with nothing in it and uh, if you click the add button then you'll uh, actually that's what fill that's what puts that line there and then if you click under in the pink area under short filter and under long filter etc you'll get a list of shortwave filters so these are the filters between 0.6 and 2.3 microns long filter or the filters between 2.4 and 5 microns and then you have to pick out one of those readout patterns that I mentioned earlier so if you're observing bright sources you probably want to pick the rapid pattern you put in the number of groups the number of integrations and at right you see that you get a uh, a photon collection time and a total photon collection time. The photon collection time includes all integrations and all subpixel dithers. Actually, I think it includes all dithers. And then the total photon collection time includes. <laughs> now, I think the first one is just the subpixel dithers and the total photon collection time includes the primary dithers as well. So you might not get the total photon collection time on all points on the sky because you've got gaps in the between the detectors um, and regions around the outside edge of the field of view after the dithering that are, have a lesser depth. Um, at any rate, these are these two fields are, are telling you how how long you're collecting data and or what you would use for calculating signal to noise, for instance, in the exposure time calculator. <clears throat> yeah, so this is just calling out what those the photon and total photon collection times are. Um, if you want to add more filters, then you just click the add button again. You can also use the duplicate function to duplicate the previous example and for pre previous exposure and then alter it slightly. Um, things like that. You can insert uh, exposures above a, a particular exposure and on the observatory these exposures are going to are going to occur in the order that you specify them in this list so if you want to have have them in a specific order you can do that uh, so this is just showing uh, if I switch from the 160 squared subarray from the previous example to uh, full frame, you'll see that the photon collection, the, the the photon collection time for full frame is 107 seconds in that first exposure. With the subarray, it's only 2.8 seconds. So that gives you an idea of how strong an influence the subarray has on your integration times. I think that's a duplicate. Oh, so yeah, so just a reminder that the the amount of time that you're getting over here depends on the um, your integration time, so the um, readout pattern and number of groups that you picked and the subarray size and on the dithers. So if you want to know the length of a single integration ramp, set the number of integrations to one and set the number of subpixel positions to one, and that'll tell you the integration the raw integration time per integration ramp. And that's important because that's what determines your saturation limits. Uh, you can't look at a template that's filled out like this with two integrations and four dithers without, you have to realize that that's actually telling you the total integration time for eight, expo eight integrations, not a single integration. And that's not the way I would do it, but <laughs> That's what we're stuck with for now. Uh, we may be able to get the single single integration ramp time added to this interface. In the meantime, you have to figure out how to how to retrieve it yourself. Uh, okay, I'm going to skip that. So I think um, there's a little bit less than ten minutes left. There are uh, some more examples in this chart packet that should be posted in a couple days, and I'll. I'll put a announcement in the DPS and PEN news, newsletter exploders uh, to 
point to the chart packet once it's been posted, um, so you can download it and look it over. There's a near spec example and maybe a MIRI example as well. Also some stuff about visualizing and things like that. Um, but for now, I think I'll stop and see if we have questions online or in the room. So no one's uh, typed any questions in online. Okay. <coughs> Um, so there's been a lot of work done about uh, saturation on really bright targets. Mm -hmm. um, so are those limits for the integration, or are there even more relaxed limits for like the first read or something, where you could still, since those are preserved, you could still get usable data? Yeah. So for most of the instruments, if I go back up to this. Um, so for NearCam, you have. NearCam's got 10 detectors, so we're the total data hog, and so that's why we have more exposure patterns with higher levels of compression. Most of the instruments uh, have uh, modes that are, so for instance, near spec, the NRS rapid mode is is basically raw data collection. You're getting every sample out of those those detectors. Um, so yeah, the the if you in the ETC say I want six groups, it's going to tell you that you're saturated at the end of the integration time for six groups. But that doesn't mean that you're going to be saturated after one group. So if you want you to... You can specify one group. And you one. can specify one group and see whether, you know, and the pipeline will fit a ramp to one group, <laughs> fit a ramp. Um, or two groups, or however many are not saturated. So it'll look at the ramp, say, okay, these are these reads are saturated, these reads are not saturated. It'll determine the slope based on the unsaturated reads. So yeah, so the saturation limit, but the saturation limits you see in the ETC are for the full integration ramp time. What is tech pixel detector? Uh, so once, so the the. The big benefit of implementing moving target tracking is that the moving target becomes fixed on the detector. Is that like a feature model or pilot? It could be either one. Okay, good. Yeah, so if Jupiter's rotating and you say point at the great red spot, it'll track the great red spot. If you say track Jupiter, it'll track Jupiter and Jupiter will rotate in the field of view. Yeah. Um, so what? And that's why all you can use all the templates for a moving target with without restriction. Is because once you once you're tracking, it's a fixed target. All the stars are moving, but it's a fixed target. And also, all the pipeline modules work on the moving target data essentially the same way they work on the fixed target data. There's there's a little tweak we have to do at the beginning, but that means we can use the whole pipeline as well. And there was talk of the mode as I don't know if it's a mode. I don't know. Was it called shadow mode? It basically, it was observed the same patch of sky after your moving target has moved away. Yeah. So that uh, is still, as far as I know, in the schedule for cycle one. Um, and then there's a wrinkle on that called uh, moving follow-on, which isn't in the build schedule. But you can mimic the mo moving follow-on by specifying a, a rate constraint. So you can say, I want to observe my target when it's moving two arc seconds per minute, and then specify a timing constraint between the two observations. And that'll then pin down how you know how far it will have moved between the two. And so yeah, there are ways to do that. And there'll be additional webinars and a work a full workshop this fall a two and a half day workshop where we'll get into observing strategies and things like that that'll allow people to remove stars from their data things so you say that cycle two we're looking at have that follow-on mode <coughs> yes yeah, like well it's like it's not in this it's not in the schedule at all oh, okay. right so I, I hope that it'll be there for cycle two in the meantime we can we can fake the system out. Has it been used for HST observers? No. Not much. <clears throat> also, one of my favorite buttons when I'm doing APT stuff is the view in the lab. Yes. 
And that certainly makes a lot of sense for fixed targets. What happens in moving targets if you use it? It doesn't do anything. <laughs> doesn't do anything. Yeah. Yeah, so if, if you download the charts afterwards, right. there's uh, various charts in, in here about how you can uh, put in a fixed target as a proxy for your moving target, and then a little bit about how to do visualizations, uh, how to see how your dithers are executing, things like that. But what you won't see is how your fields of view are trailed across the sky as the exposure occurs. Here's a question online. Um, Russell. Um, it says, wouldn't the chronographic mode be a good way to study structure in the tail of a comet and so might be useful for both NERC and Lemuria? Yeah, it, it might well be. It, it might also be useful for satellite searches. Um, the, the inner working angles are not particularly competitive with what you can do from the ground at the short near infrared wavelengths. And so you may actually be better off just using a ground-based, a large ground-based telescope. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's an interesting thing. It'd be nice to see someone explore that a little bit more for moving targets and satellite searches and coma, and see what uh, what applications might might actually pan out. Um, if there's any other questions online, uh, you could go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Got a couple in the room. Uh, I wanted to ask about, so does APT know anything about data volume? It does. Um, so it, uh, one of the, f let's see. So, uh, da, 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 da. Where, is the, where is the data volume? I, I think the data volume, oh yeah, it's, um, so right under the visit splitting and duration fields that are grayed out, there's a data volume. It's zero megabytes because it's there's nothing been specified here. But as we go down, so here I've added a single exposure, and so the data volume is three megabytes. So it does tabulate that for you. It tells you, but does it restrict you? So if I want all readouts, does it say, no, you can't do that? It'll tell you if you get above uh, the threshold. So there is a threshold built yeah. in somewhere. You'll get an error or a warning depending on what, how bad you go and what uh, kind of place. Yeah. Yeah, there, there are other, there's also a data rate restriction that's got to do with some of the onboard hardware. Um, so you, we can't store data as fast as NearCam will create it if you're using all 10 detectors in raw mode or in rapid mode. So uh, there are restrictions on them. Exposure parameters. If you got, if you pick modules equals both, that's ten detectors. Then it'll restrict your exposure parameters so that you don't flood the um, the data pipe. And there's no data compression, or there is data compression. Right? Well, just in terms of the the co adding of those frames, <coughs> that's the data co -adding, But yeah. there's no compression. On there was supposed to be, and they found that they couldn't compress it, so they just dropped it. How is that update by the sites that are closest to the center itself? So to speak. With, 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 with so with the memory use. Well, um, it's an interesting situation because all the, you know, the bulk of the solar system ephemeris stuff has been used, done using the old guide star catalogs. And now with Gaia. What's the old guide star? GC2 or GC1? That type of stuff, yeah, sure. or worse. Okay. <laughs> Some of these things have been observed for a long time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, to the extent that the old catalogs on average represent the Gaia catalog now, the orbital elements should be correct. But I, I've asked people that do astrometry and try and determine orbits for these things a few times about, you know, what's the impact of the Gaia catalog and all that. Are, are people going to reprocess old measurements using the Gaia coordinates instead of the old catalog coordinates? And it's just too much, too much work. Um, so we'll see. <laughs> I have a question, if you could go back to the, uh, um, the field of view chart. 
that shows all their experience. Way up top. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so what are the distances on here? Because what I'm interested in knowing is if you're planning an observation of something near a bright force, like let's say you're looking at a moon of Jupiter, what if Jupiter drifts into the FGS field of view? <laughs> It's a good question. <laughs> yeah, so the, the near one near cam field of view there is 2.2 arc minutes across, and the FGS field of view is essentially the same for one of their detectors. So, uh, yeah, these we're going to have giant planets close to or in the guider for satellite observations, and that's a, an area that we're actively looking at right now to try and model how it affects the FGS performance and determine what the best response is. We, we think the simplest thing would be to simply restrict that guider, because there are two. And so you can just say, we know Jupiter's in guider one, so we're only going to use guider two to guide stars for this observation. The bigger worry is, what if you have to keep Jupiter five, minute, five arc minutes from the guider? rather than only worried about it when it's in the guider. And then you may end up losing both guiders for certain certain epochs. Um, and that's what we're trying to model. And we'll be working on that in the next few months. Didn't you do a study that showed that it was very rare that this problem would happen? Well, no, we showed for Titan that it actually was a problem like 20% of the time. If you had Titan in the I think it was near spec IFU. So it was okay. <laughs> for certain targets. So it's not rare. It's not rare enough. And that's in the that's in the guide. Yeah. So if it's if if there's a bigger exclusion zone than just the direct field of view of the guide, then it's a worse problem. So similarly, if you had a science, so if you had a bright target in uh, one of the science instrument apertures. Would there be any issue with scattered light into the guider aperture? Uh, potentially, yeah. So that we'll model that as well. Having Jupiter or scattered light in the guider is not necessarily, you know, game over. Yeah, we don't know. It, it we think it would actually guide. Yeah. <clears throat> the question is, could it find the stars? And that's that's what we're looking at. Yeah. One, once it identifies the guide star. The FGS just puts a small subarray on that guide star, so it's not going to see anything else in the detector. But it's, it's but it, getting to that point is the, yeah. is the criteria for success. The thing is, if it's a moving target, then that subarray may, may move. And oh, yes, if the move. pattern yeah. of scattered light is, is variable spatially, yeah. then that could introduce an issue. Good. So are, they, are they still using the FFT in the, the for the... Yes. Centroid? The DFT. DFT, yes. Sorry. But, and that's not biased by a, a, con a constant background? Um, it, it, it is, I think, but, you know, if it's a constant background and it's the same thing, is that? Because the centroid is biased towards the center with a constant background is its yeah. problem. But with scattered light, you could have a variable background. Well, I'm gonna, yeah, but I know there's going to be a constant background, yeah. <laughs> and normally it's not that high in a very short exposure that we're doing in the guider, so it's not that big of a bias. But if you've got something from Jupiter pulling, your background could be a significant number, and you need to know. Yeah, no, these these things need to be modeled. <clears throat> I think we're probably um, okay. out of time for today. Right. Um, but thanks, John, for uh, your nice talk. Um, and uh, as John said, the slides and the recording will get posted on the web. Yep. Thank you. We made um, three observations, both uh, 